and sometimes all three of us have to say that at you know, the same time about a song. It's like, we wouldn't have come up with this on our own. He brings something that I can't bring, and Dan brings something that Jonathan can't bring, that we all bring something that the other person can't bring. Him and I would write a lot of the Loma stuff, and then bring it to Emily, and, and then she would kind of shape the songs in a way that was, was more with her sensibilities. It's always nice with Brian Eno on the backside of an album. How was working with him? Well, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, we never spoke. I communicated with him entirely through his manager. We sort of built the house and then he put all the finishing touches on it. What is the other job? I am what's called an end of life doula. A lot of it is just companionship and making sure that their space is peaceful for when they go. Hey, Emily. Hi there. You're in London? I'm in England. Um, I'm actually in Dorset. Hello. Hey, Jonathan. I myself am in um, I'm Florida. Hey, Dan. Where are you? I'm in, uh, I'm in Texas. Well, this is, uh, I live in the house where we uh, made our record. Here, I'll flip this around for you. Yeah. This is the studio, yeah. 360 here. Whoa. Yep. See you walking in the dark See you standing in the line Do you feel at home in the atmosphere of the album? Is this Emily Cross? Yeah, some of it. <laughs> <laughs> some of it is. Sometimes the atmosphere is uncomfortable to me, but that's life. The uncomfortable thing is not being 100% comfortable with some some choices that we make as a band, which is good. It's a good thing, but it wouldn't be the same if it was just me making the song. Don't shy. When we're working together, often when we get you know well into a song, we'll have a moment where somebody steps, steps back and says, "You know, I never would have made anything like this on my own." And sometimes all three of us have to say that at, you know the same time about a song. It's like we wouldn't have come up with this on our own on purpose, and yet that combination is, it yields that result. How do you experience working with Jonathan Myberg, who is quite experienced in the business already? He recorded some some ten albums with Shearwater. Yeah, he's experienced but he's also incredibly flexible in his mindset so it's not like he is set in his ways and thinks that there's only one thing one way to do something he's very open to new possibilities i think he likes to work with other people he has a whole record of covering other bands and he likes to work with different he likes to collaborate i'm glad that i could find a working relationship with someone like that don't shy away I have a band called Cross Record. Dan was in the band for the second record. And we were the opening band on tour with Shearwater. And it's very rare that you tour with a band and you see them every night and you know what their set's going to be like and you still feel compelled to watch it every time because I just couldn't believe the sound that these two people were making. Then he asked us to make a record together, and so we just said, okay, we'll try it. I thought if we worked together, I would start to understand this more. And uh, in some ways I do, and in some ways I don't. Uh, it's, they both, both of them retain their kind of mystery for me, mm -hmm. uh, which I love because they, they come up with ideas that I wouldn't have. He brings something that I can't bring, and Dan brings something that Jonathan can't bring, that we all bring something that the other person can't bring. You know, we really challenge each other, and we don't go forward to the decision unless um, we can agree. You know, him and I would write a lot of the Loma stuff and then bring it to Emily, and, ha and then she would kind of shape the songs in a way that was, was more with her sensibilities. <laughs>
Dan is a is a wonderful, wonderful collaborator. He's so steady, and but he, he's a little uh, taciturn, or he can be. But he's just a wonderfully expressive musician. He's one of the most talented musicians I've ever worked with, and very, very willing to be wrong. Uh, uh, so you might ask him about about uh, about ask him about scratching itches. Scratching the itches. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> that's funny that he said that. It's, it's sort of like if if I have an idea or, and I'd be like, okay, I'm just thinking of this part as I'm imagining it. I just want to I just want to try it so I can hear it, even though I know it's probably not going to work. Uh, it's like I just kind of scratch the itch. And I think we have a rule um, at the studio, and I have this with my other clients that is I don't like to say I don't like to shoot anything down or say no to anything until we hear it first because you just have to hear the sound coming out of the speakers with the song before you know for sure if it's gonna be good or not so we gotta scratch the itch what is the story of the song Osotillo or Osotillo how do you pronounce it I've mostly heard it been said like Ocotillo it's a plant it's a desert plant if you ask Jonathan about it he can probably give you a a history of the plant and everything. It's sort of a cactus-like plant uh, that grows in, in in the southwestern U.S. and Mexico, uh, yeah. in arid regions, and it um, it looks like just a, a, a set of stalks that are covered in thorns, and it looks basically dead, uh, except when it rains, which in those places it does very frequently. But when it does rain, um, it just suddenly comes to life, um, very briefly, and then goes back to it, you know. It, seems to die again and waiting for the next rain. The, the song to me feels like the drive from, you know, across I-10, uh, Interstate 10, if you're going across Texas heading west towards you know, New Mexico and Arizona. The, the whole world seems to change around you as, you as you make this drive and you feel like you've entered a different world. So there's a feeling of uh, possibility with that, of um, you know, that you're, you feel that your life might be different from now on. And that's the feeling that I wanted to, to capture in the song. Would you normally be on a tour? Yeah, maybe we might be on tour if it weren't for the virus. How do you describe 2020 yourself? A test in many ways and uncertainty. We have a sense of security normally that isn't there anymore, at least for me. Is that a financial thing or is people? Yeah, my job, my job is dealing with people. So not, not music, but my, my day job. What is the other job? I am what's called an end of life doula. So I work with those at the end of life. I help them get everything in order and I help their families and I sit with them as they're dying. And then I, uh, I mean, I can look at a lot of different ways, but a lot of it is just companionship and making sure that their space is peaceful for when they go mm -hmm. and then helping with arrangements afterwards and that kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. So what do you learn from that job? Many stories, oh, of course. Gosh. You hear a lot of so, stories. So much, yeah. The main thing I've learned is that, well, the main thing I've gained is just, I guess, a more positive outlook on my life. And and I do what I want. If I want to do something, I'll do it because I don't know when I'll be able to do it again within reason, of course. But yeah, I'm a much happier person now. <laughs> It's always nice with Brian Eno on the backside of an album. How was working with him? Was it a different level? Uh, well, the funny thing is that, uh, you know, we never spoke. I communicated with him entirely through his manager after he said some very kind things about our song Black Willow on the BBC and then again on, on French national radio. Uh, so I reached out and said, we do not want Brian Eno to produce our record. But, <laughs> because I'm sure he's heard that plenty. 
Uh, but, you know, if you'd be willing to maybe, you know, engage in some way with some tracks, if you sent them to him, would be, he'd be interested. We worked on it for a while here and got it kind of, you know, we pushed the, we pushed the rock up the hill as far as we could get it. Then we just kind of sent it off and, and hoped for the best. And several months went by, and then one day this mix just turned up in the middle of the night. He had completely remixed the song. He'd added some more elements. He'd add, he'd changed the chords a little bit. He'd repeated some sections, altered the vocals slightly. But all the elements that we gave him were still sort of there. He rearranged the ending to make sense where we couldn't uh, we couldn't figure it out. So we sort of built the house, and then he put all the finishing touches on it. It was richer and deeper and more. I mean, it was exactly the Eno thing. You know, it's like why is this so compelling? His, my favorite recordings of his have this depth and space and uh, feeling of thought to them that um, is very hard to explain. I can imagine that someone like you, who is very well equipped and also well aware about how a song would sound like, uh, it's probably very hard to take a producer's opinion or a producer's sound. With, with Brian Eno, it's an exception because it's kind of like, well, it's Brian Eno, so he can do whatever he wants with it. This feels like a band that's very close, and the sound is also us. It's us doing songs and us being a band. And we know it's because of Corona, but doesn't this give you a bad feeling that you haven't seen the band members, the other members? We're kind of used to that because we were, we were always kind of separated unless we're making something. Of course, I would want to see them more often. They're my friends and I love them very much, but I think we're used to being apart, so it's not that bad. And we talk, we, get, we email each other and we, we, we are in each other's hearts. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.